So this is the first lesson of the first unit of a new course, which is our MCV4U course on calculus and vectors. In this first unit, we're going to be taking a look at tangent lines, which is something we're already familiar with from the advanced functions course. And we're also going to be taking a look at limits, which is something you may have discussed or you may have figured out a little bit on your own in that course, but we're going to be formalizing it now and uh, taking it further. Now, the big part of this first part of the course, calculus and vectors, for the first, more than the first half, we'll be looking at calculus. So let's just get a quick idea of what it is that we're talking about. There were two problems that um, people were looking at in around the 17th century, and they were trying to figure out uh, two answers to two questions. Now, obviously, they weren't looking at them just in the context of these problems. They were also looking to use or to solve these problems to help them solve other problems that, that were being worked on at the time. The first one is, what is the slope of a tangent to a curve? Now, we've already discussed this in the context of approximating the slope because, as you can see here from this very rough diagram, I could, if I want to know the slope at the point A, well, I can approximate that by just drawing a straight line between A and B. And if I move this point B closer and closer to A, in other words, if I make this gap, this delta X, which we've also represented as H, if I make this gap very small, so if I make the gap only this wide, then that line, the slope of that line, is going to be a better and better approximation of the true tangent line. But how can we come up with a true tangent line? That was one of the questions that led to calculus. The idea that an approximation is not good enough. And the second one, which we really have not touched upon at all, which is, is there any way that I can take this continuous and smooth function, f of x, now, in this case, you might look at that and think, oh, that looks like a sinusoidal function. It doesn't actually matter what function it is we're talking about here. The question is, can I figure out the area of this shaded region under the curve between any two values of x, between a and b? So I know if this is the function f of x, I know that this has the coordinates b, comma, f of b. And I know that this point has the coordinates a comma f of a. But is there any way that I can somehow figure out this area? And so that was another problem that was being worked on. And you couldn't solve this problem until calculus was developed. Now, for what we're going to be looking at today, uh, really very much of just a refresher of something we've looked at in the past, which is the idea of rationalizing expressions. So if I start with an expression that involves some radicals, and in particular, I have a fraction here where I have a radical in the denominator, that, that expression, root a over root b, is the same thing as root a over root b multiplied by 1. And we've done this many, many times, the idea that you can multiply anything by 1 and it doesn't change that thing. But 1 on its own may not be very interesting to us, but far more interesting might be to multiply by this way of expressing 1, which is root b over root b. Now, of course, it is understood that here b is not equal to 0. We already had a b in the denominator of the original expression, so b was never going to be allowed to be 0. But if I'm going to multiply it in this form, I have to be aware of the fact that that denominator cannot be 0. And what happens is root a times root b becomes the square root of a b. But root b times root b is just equal to b. And I have rationalized this denominator. There is no more radical in the denominator here. Now that's a pretty simple case. A more complex and a more interesting case would be something where I have a more complicated denominator. For the sake of simplicity, I just made the numerator 1 because we don't actually care about the numerator and there's no point in making our lives difficult with the example. Our lives will become difficult enough as we work through the homework associated with this. So I have 1 over the square root of a minus the square root of b. So the way the 1 that I'm going to multiply this by, I didn't write it out this time, but 
hopefully you can understand that this is the one that I'm multiplying by and that value is I am multiplying by the what is known as the conjugate of the denominator so I have square root of a minus the square root of b the conjugate of that as I say here square root of a plus the square root of b is the conjugate of square root of a minus square root of b so I multiply top and bottom by the conjugate one multiplied by this conjugate is simply root a plus root b but square root a minus square root b times square root a plus square root b this is the pattern of a difference of squares so maybe I'll just a, a little quick aside down here so I have root a minus root b times root a plus root b let me just clean that up and that is a difference of squares and that means I'm going to take the first value all squared that's root a all squared minus the second value all squared that's root b all squared and of course the square root of a all squared is just a minus the square root of b all squared is just b and so we end up with a minus b in the denominator so now a couple of examples rationalize the denominator so in this case now the one thing for this fairly simple one is that the only thing I need to really get rid of in this denominator is the radical so although it would be correct to multiply top and bottom by 2 root 3 it's actually unnecessary to multiply by the 2 doesn't add anything all we want to do is get rid of the radical and so now I end up with in the numerator I end up with 4 root 3 and in the denominator I get 2 and I'm only going to do this this one time root 3 all squared root 3 times root 3 is root 3 all squared but of course I and I could have actually I should have simplified this further I realize only now I had 4 over 2 here but I'm seeing that now so 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 4 twice. And root 3 times root 3, or root 3 all squared, is just 3. So I end up with 2 times root 3 in the numerator. And I end up with 1 times 3 in the denominator. And that's my final answer. Here, I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of this denominator so I'm going to be multiplying by root 3 minus root 5 over root 3 minus root 5 and that is equal to 4 times root 3 minus root 5 all divided by and now I'm not going to write it out the way I did before so this is a difference of squares so square root of 3 all squared is just 3 minus the square root of 5 all squared is just 5 so I end up with 4 times the square root of 3 minus the square root of 5 all divided by negative 2 and to simplify that we're going to 4 divided by negative 2 is simply negative 2 times the square root of 3 minus the square root of 5 that's perfectly good as is or you could have written this as negative 2 root 3 plus 2 root 5 that would have been fine and of course to write it the other way 2 root 5 minus 2 root 3 any of those are are perfectly fine the important part here of course was rationalizing but this step from here to here you must do this step if you left it in this form you would you would be facing some sort of deduction for not seeing that you could divide out the common factor there make the division okay now sometimes you will be asked to actually rationalize the numerator rather than the denominator and we'll see later on as we continue with this unit why that could end up being useful so it's the same idea though so to rationalize the numerator in this case I just multiply by the conjugate of the numerator so that's going to be root 72 plus root 8 over 
root 72 plus root 8. And I get a difference of squares here. So this becomes 72 minus 8 over. And I don't like to multiply this 10 into this, this entire term yet because sometimes I'm looking for something to divide out between the numerator and denominator. So I'm just going to leave that as root 72 plus root 8. And then we have 72 minus 8, which is equal to 64, over 10 root 72 plus root 8. And my instinct there, or my preference there, was, was correct. I can divide 2 into there 5 times, and I can divide 2 into there 32 times. And so I end up with my final answer is 32 over 5 times the square root of 72 plus the square root of 8. Now beware of any temptations you may have to rationalize this again. We were specifically told to rationalize this in the first place. Now we were just asked to rationalize but it should be understood whenever you're doing your at this level grade 12 course it should be understood that simplifying is also something you are responsible for. Now, whenever I want you to do that, I will generally say simplify, rationalize and simplify, but I might just say rationalize. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because we could go further here. The square root of 72 is actually the same thing as square root of 36 times 2, and the square root of 8 is actually the square root of 4 times 2. And so we end up with 32 over 5 times. Square root of 36 is 6 with the root 2 left behind. And the square root of 4 is 2 with a root 2 left behind. And as you can see, this is actually going to simplify quite nicely. 5 will stay out in front for one more round here. 6 root 2 plus 2 root 2 is actually 8 root 2. And now I can do one more division, which is 8 goes into 8 once, and 8 goes into 32 four times. And our final simplified version is 4 over 5 root 2. And again, we're not, we've, we've been asked to rationalize the numerator, so this actually is your final answer. Also to point out, we could have actually done some of this simplification right away. We had root 72 minus root 8, which we could have written here as... Actually, let me just write it in its simplified form. Root 72 is actually 6 root 2 minus 4 root 2. Sorry, minus 2 root 2. So we could have actually made that simplification right away, which would have made things much easier. But part of the idea here was to show you that the idea of multiplying by the conjugate still applies, whether it's numerator or denominator. Okay, let's move on to this next one. It's not an equals. We're actually going to be multiplying here by the conjugate. And this one's a little bit more intimidating. It's not just numbers. We've got a variable here inside the radical and a variable here in the denominator. But remember, our goal here is simply to rationalize. So I'm going to take the conjugate of the numerator, which is the square root of x minus 6. Be careful with your notation here. Make sure it's clear that x minus 6 is in the radical. Minus 5 over the square root of x minus 6 minus 5. And that is equal to, again, difference of squares in the numerator. So that's just going to be x minus 6 minus 5 times negative 5, is, that's minus 25. So a little bit of a curveball there. Because this 5 was not a radical, I do actually have to square it. Whereas I'm using the squaring action just to get rid of the radical sign for x minus 6. And this one is just x times the square root of x minus 6 minus 5. And simplifying that, I get x minus 6 minus 25 is x minus 31 over x times square root of x minus 6 minus 5. And nothing further can be done to rationalize that numerator. It is rationalized and there's no way to simplify that denominator. 
And that's it for this first lesson. Hopefully you found that quite straightforward, just a review of some past concepts, and you can go ahead and try to put that into practice in the assigned work.